Hey everybody, how's everybody doing today? Welcome to my Thursday live stream where we talk about photography and catch up on what's new and you know, uh, do the best I can to answer any questions you might have about uh, Olympus cameras and uh, you know, any kind of photography questions in general. Um, let me raise up my seat a little bit. But uh, well, it's uh, it's good to be back on. I haven't been streaming quite as much lately, but um, you know, for those of you who've been following me, you know, my neck is feeling a lot better now. Um, I mean, I'm still not 100%, but we're definitely on the road to recovery. And I think uh, that's why I scheduled uh, two streams today, one for uh, photo chat. And then at two o'clock, you know, four hours from now, uh, I'm going to do the uh, <clears throat> Photo, edit, photo editing stream. So, and a lot of you have already submitted some pictures there. So that should be a lot of fun. I always enjoy doing those. Um, but I, like I said, I kind of cut back this month just to kind of stay away from looking down all the time, right? So I've re readjusted my studio here a little bit so that I can uh, sit a little more straight up, best I can anyway. Oh, still not, still not quite right, but Anyhow, uh, good to see you, Randy, Chris and Johannes, uh, Ethel, good to see you, and uh, Matt, Matt's here, good. Um, hey, Randy, wow, that was an amazing uh, moonshot you did with your uh, EM1X. I saw it on your Flickr page. Um, so that was, that was that a single shot, just a single shot with your EM1X, 300 millimeter F4 with a 2X teleconverter, handheld. Needless to say, that was pretty amazing. I had to stack like 60 images to get something kind of similar to that uh, when I when I did a moonshot and you got it in, in one shot. That's pretty amazing. And, uh, you know, I saw some uh, posts in the uh, forum as well where you guys are submitting your images to be edited by others. And, and there's always been some interesting uh, edits there. Um, Right now, it seems to be like Serge and DeMorkin and a few others uh, posting some great edits there. So I'm glad you guys are carrying that on while I was kind of absent in the photo editing part. And uh, yeah, 1200 millimeter equivalent, right? Single shot. Yeah, I saw you said you were leaning against the pole, but I wasn't sure it was a single shot. Oh, Thomas Zaskis is here. Good to see you. Good morning. Atlanta, Georgia, sunny and 16 degrees Celsius. Oh, that's pretty warm, actually. That's that's in the 50s uh, Fahrenheit, I believe, uh, closer to 60. And we're probably close to that here. I know we're supposed to hit about 50 today uh, Fahrenheit. So I'm so grateful. I mean, I'm so tired of being cold all the time. And hey, Barana, how are you? <laughs> God, the stupidest thing happened to me this week, you know. Um, I was, I was, you know, I've, I've, um, I've been uh, painting my bedroom and getting that ready. And like I was saying last week, that is the first time I've slept in a bed in almost a year. Really, uh, I've been sleeping on the sofa forever, but I finally got the room about. 80 to 90 percent there i still have to do some touch up and think about hanging some pictures because right now i just have some bare walls uh but um i think it's it's looking pretty good maybe i'll show you guys a couple of pictures I, I mean i don't know if anybody cares to see my bedroom or not but um i'm i'm pretty happy with the direction it's going because it's you know i live in an old old house and that's uh, that room is where my uncle stayed a few years ago before he passed away. And, and it just it was a wreck, you know, because he was, you know, he was all shaky and stuff, always spilling things. And, and it, it took a lot of work to to kind of get it. But I did it with minimal cost. <laughs> uh, I just bought two gallons of paint and somebody gave me a carpet and I reused furniture that I've had for the last 20 years. The only thing new in the room really is a um is the mattress you know that's that's very new uh never slept on it before i've had it for over a year but i haven't rolled it out yet because i was waiting to finish the bedroom and uh the morgan says oh you just got back from the hospital um 
Okay, just test. Okay, I hope you're feeling okay. And uh, OM Solutions put a lot out on 40. Yeah, I haven't read that yet. I just saw Peter's video, just like David Crooks. Hey, David, how are you? Uh, about what OM Digital Solutions is doing. And uh, from what Peter was talking about, I didn't really hear anything new there. They just sort of announced uh, the same things they've been saying, you know, in, in different places right up till now. But I haven't watched the, the actual Japanese interview video that Peter posted. So I'm going to watch that, and I'll talk about that more this Sunday, I think, uh, and give some thought to that. Because, um, you know, it, it's really exciting to see that, you know, at least on their on on its face, it looks like OM Digital Solutions is going to continue the Olympus uh, legacy. Uh, just that I had semi-predicted, you know, last year when I talked about it, you know, when they first announced it, you know, if you if you look at a stream, I, I called it, uh, you know, Sunday live stream or something or Thursday. And I just said, no, nah, it'll be fine. Right. <laughs> Was the title. It'll be fine. And it looks like it's going to be. So that's that's a great thing. They're going to continue the OMD line, the pen line and the tough line. So that's uh, virtually all of it. Right. I'm curious to see uh, if they do come out with a pen F2. That would be that would be pretty awesome if they could do that, and uh, I'd also like to see a really hardcore upgrade to the OMD. I mean, they have the new processor now, but they really need to add a few more accessories to it. You know, like a better EVF, maybe a better live view screen, and uh, maybe in a new and improved battery. You know, it fits the same slot and would be backwards compatible, but a battery that has a little higher capacity uh, would be nice too. Not that it's bad now, it's actually really good, but uh, more is better, right? And and a few more features would be nice too, uh, like a new sensor, um, I guess, and and more, more, um, more photography related features and video features. You know, I'd like to see the the when I talked to Ben this weekend about the uh, astrophotography. If you guys haven't seen that live stream and you're interested in astrophotography, it's a terrific stream with Ben from the Narrowband channel. Uh, but an intervalometer that does uh, virtually you know unlimited exposure times, you know, like 30 minutes, 60 minutes exposure times instead of one minute, which is the limitation now. That would be a simple software tweak or a firmware update. Uh, so I'd like to see them do that to our EM1s. And then also, um, you know, maybe a bump in megapixels slightly, maybe to 24, uh, just to kind of get it up there with everything else, at least on paper, it'll look better. But at the very least, you know, if not more megapixels, then have a, a BSI sensor, right? That'll just be a little more sensitive to light and give us a little better performance in ISO. Uh, but they don't need to do much. I mean, the cameras do a great job already with image quality. So I'm very, very content with the image quality. So I'm just looking for some small tweaks, you know, um, in, in, the, in the firmware and in the EVF, just to give a little better user experience uh, would, would be nice. Um, and let's see. Uh, Marsha's here. Hi, Marsha. And Steve Page. Hello, Barry. You've been potting tomatoes and melons this morning. 79 degrees in Florida. God, you're so lucky. And Andreas, good to see you. Um, and Marsha, very concise and insightful. Yes, Peter did a good job, Marsha. Well, I should be using my new chat thing here. Let me scroll down. Uh, yeah, this is what I was reading. <laughs> Want to hear from Marsha and, and then what is Randy talking about? Mounted a tripod inside the car for driving and put an EPL-8 on it, making videos with comments for my YouTube channel. A new thing. Oh, that's awesome, Randy. You know what you ought to do is just um, email me your YouTube channel uh, 
And then, you know, when you get some content on there, you know, we can, we can, uh, you know, talk about it here during the stream and hopefully get you a few viewers at least, right? Um, but I, you know, what I used, where is it? Oh, here. <clears throat> I bought one of these little Z mount type uh, stands that lets me, you know, put this on the dashboard of my car, mount my camera on the dashboard of my car very easily. Uh, and I found that works pretty well. You know, full on tripod, you know, you got to take up a whole seat. Another thing you can do since the EPL8 is so light is I also got a suction cup mount for like a GPS, um, but it has a quarter 20 screw on the end. And then I can mount the camera directly to the windshield. And EPL8 with say, you know, the 15 millimeter or the nine millimeter body cap, the nine millimeter body cap lens with the EPL8 on a little suction cup uh, stick would be perfect, I think. I, I use it for my DJI Osmo. I actually mount this this onto the dashboard of my car or onto the window of my car because it's small and light, but the EPL-8 is not much heavier, especially if you put the body cap lens on it. And, you know, since you'll be driving around during the day mostly, um, the 9 millimeter will be just wide enough to give you a nice field of view while you're driving. The only challenge I found when mounting a camera inside a car is uh, is the reflections off the windshield. And a polarizer might help. I haven't tried that. But then you have to use a heavier lens and all that. Uh, but what I like about the EPL-8 is, you know, you can stick the uh, three... Uh, uh, 3.5 millimeter jack on it so you can actually talk while you're driving with a wireless mic or a lavalier mic a wired mic doesn't matter uh, directly into the video and get nice clean audio I used to do it separately with my um, where is it I used to be right here but my uh, VP10 Olympus VP10 microphone that's just a little stick microphone with a thumb switch on the top so it makes it easy. You don't have to look at the microphone. You got a physical thumb. Switch up to record. Switch down to stop. Uh, right on the end, and it excellent, excellent audio quality. And you can clip it right here to your collar, so you get really good audio from that. And then you just sync it up and post later. Um, and George asks, have I seen any communication from Joe Alex? He seems to have disappeared from, but yeah, I know. I, I have not seen anything. I, um, and I, I haven't, honestly, I haven't reached out to him, but I guess I, I could try, you know, because um, he, he really did have a great channel there, and then he just stopped. Um, so I hope everything's okay. And George says, have you, oh, I just, And I'm scrolling down. And Juan Carlos Garcia says, good morning, everyone. I'm a Sony shooter who's joining the Olympus family. I purchased the M10 Mark II and loved it. So now I'm in hooked with it and bought a second camera. Uh, yeah, the M10 Mark II is still, I think, Olympus's best camera ever, you know, based on its price point uh, because it has virtually all of the features of the EM1 Mark II, for example, uh, at a third the cost, roughly, right? And, you know, depending on how you shop, but about a third the cost. And the same image quality and, you know, virtually the same. Everything is it's right there. I mean, it's, it's a third the cost, but it's probably 80 to 90% the camera the EM1 Mark II is you know, aside from weather sealing and, you know, the obvious differences, but, uh, and, you know, I, I beat mine up so much. I used it so much that I'm not going to be shooting with it much going forward. I'll probably be using the M5 Mark II, which is just a, uh, basically a better version of the M10 Mark II because they added weather sealing and a little better build quality, you know, but it costs twice as much. Again, the M5 Mark II, in my opinion, isn't twice the camera the M10 Mark II is. I would say it's about, you know, 10% better. But 
it is it is a it is a nice nice camera it just shows how good the m10 mark ii was so i'm glad i'm glad you're with us now and you'll really i think you'll really enjoy it because that, that that was the camera they got me off of the nikon d750 full frame camera um it was the m10 mark ii i mean i i just was amazed at, at the build quality the features and the image quality that I was able to get out of this little tiny camera <laughs> and all of the lenses that go with it. Uh, and I've never went back to the to Nikon, you know, since then. And what what is Christian Yana Apple says, Randy and Rob, the M1X needs significantly more battery power. Did you notice that too? Is it because of the two processors? Oh, probably, yeah. Definitely because of the dual processing, right? Um, I mean, I don't own an EM1X, but I'm sure Randy could speak to that a little better than I can because he's owned that <laughs> for a while now. Uh, I think he owned at least two of them now, right? Um, and Randy says, the EM1X is too heavy so far for mounting. Looks like I need a EM1.3. Uh, sorry, I kind of missed. I'm missing what the conversation is. But yeah, the M1 Mark III, if, you, if you're thinking about particularly astrophotography, is a much better camera uh, because it runs a lot cooler. But for other things, the M1X is fine. And I was trying to get one here from Marsha. It says, I just bought the 40 to 150 2.8 from Map Camera in Japan. I'm very excited. They continue to email updates on shipping. I'm impressed. Good. It's always nice to get good service, right? Map Camera, it sounds familiar. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's something that, you know, I think retailers need to stay on top of is communication with their customers before and after the sale. Um, and that's something that District Camera does very good here locally, which is our local camera store. You know, I get email updates from them all the time, which I'll talk about in a minute because I, I watched one of their seminars the other day on the Fuji X100S. And then, oh, hey, Serge, how are you? Uh, Serge says, everyone wants more specs. Soon photography, we just IA or um, maybe AI, artificial intelligence, right? Computational photography. And there's definitely a lot of improvements that can be done with artificial intelligence or computational photography to make our jobs easier. But I think it's still important to understand the fundamentals and what the computations are, are being done so that you can best utilize those kinds of features. I mean, ultimately, you um, you can do probably everything a computer can do. It just, you, using a computer in the camera will save you a lot of steps or automate a lot of things. Um, so I'm all for computational photography, but I, that doesn't mean you can skip the, found, the fundamentals of photography, right? You still have to understand those things. You know, like, I mean, the best example is like handheld high-res shot mode, live ND. Those are really fantastic types of computational photography that um, give you a lot of advantages and do things that you as a human cannot do. Uh, like high-res shot mode, you know, you can't activate the shutter fast enough handheld and do all of that. You have to use a tripod um, or other methods. So handheld high-res shot mode or high-res shot mode is probably one of the best examples of computational photography that, you know, you can't do as, as a human, really. And Plato's here. Hello. <laughs> and... John, you'd say good morning. And let's see. Uh, Serge, you just bought an OM1. Congratulations. Great camera. Fully mechanical. You know, you just have to use, I think, I think if you use one of those uh, hearing aid batteries, 
that might be a good substitute because the batteries are hard to find for that. But the hearing aid batteries are relatively cheap and they should work, I think. Um, but search around the forums a little bit to figure that out to get the exact uh, part number for the battery. And whoops, I keep uh, keep clicking the wrong thing here. So now I'm back. I'm a little confused, Randy. You, you want to get a smaller, lighter camera. You don't have like an EM1 Mark II or right now already? I thought you did. Oh, you gave that to your sister, right? So now you're missing it and want a smaller camera again. Is that what it is? I'm thinking. I'm, I'm just guessing, but I'm thinking. Yeah, but an EM10 Mark II or right now a really good deal, Randy, for you would probably be an EM5 Mark II. Uh, as long as you're not doing sports action type photography, that's a terrific camera. Um, <clears throat> and I think it would suit you better uh, for the better build quality, the grip options. Because, you know, the M10 Mark II, you can't get a grip. So the M5 Mark II, you have an option for grips, uh, which, you know, you may want to take advantage of. And it also has, uh, no, nah, that's not true. But, um, but, you know, with the weather sealing is, is probably a better option for you. Or just, just get an EM-1 Mark II or Mark III. Get an EM-1 Mark III. Just skip all of that nonsense, you know? Just get an EM-1 Mark III and 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 not, not, ha not have to look back, right? And Goran Lucis is here. Greetings from Germany. Hello. And... Uh, What's this? Marco. Hey, Marco. How are you? Finally caught you mention a couple of streams ago at Rob Trek. We'll just read out to set up a collab today. Okay, good. Yeah, send me an email. I Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm ready. I'm feeling really good now. You know, I haven't had to take any, uh, you know, I, if you've been following, I haven't had to take any pain medications all week. You know, it's Wednesday and I didn't really do anything. So, oh, I need to tell that story too. Um, dang, I did have to take some this weekend though, that, or it's a Monday, Sunday or Monday, I had to take some pain meds and that, that kind of sucked. Uh, and I'll talk about why. And then Dave says, hearing aid batteries are semi-okay for the OM1, 1 1.4 versus the 1.3 original. There is a guy out there making an adapter that lets you use 1.5 modern battery steps down. Yeah, I've heard about those conversions and stuff. Uh, depending where you live, I guess that may be an option, but for many, I don't think it would be an option. I don't, I don't know. Um, you know, me personally, what I would probably do, I use the OM2FN. I have an OM2 that has, uh, that I've been using with the, you know, uh, hearing aid batteries. And it's been fine and my pictures have been coming out okay. But probably the best way to do it is to buy a separate light meter, right? Uh, that attaches to the hot shoe of your camera. They're like 100 to 200 bucks. They're a little expensive, more than you paid for the camera probably. Uh, but that'll give you the most accurate reading rather than using a meter that's, you know, 50 years old and having the voltage off and all of that. It's not as uh, glamorous, but it works. Um, yeah, the OM2N uses one point... <coughs> So maybe I'm using the regular 6.4. I haven't shot with my OM2 and in a while. Hold on. Uh, let me get caught up with the chat, and then I'm going to talk about something. Uh And Dave says, did you survive that? Yes, I did. I was fine. 
I was fine after that, David. I and you know I got a few pictures and I saw the email this morning. Kimmy won, which was cool. She was there what like five minutes, took a couple of pictures, and wins the contest. <laughs> but it was a great picture. I agree. Uh, let's see. Actually, one of the pictures I submitted for photo editing today was from that Green Springs photo walk uh, for my you know my viewers to edit. Because I didn't do a great job on it. I didn't take really a lot of great pictures that day. I was just so amazed by HP, one of the other shooters there that I, I talked to her for a little bit before uh, we left. But she she really did some beautiful images. Nothing to do with the theme, you know, frame in a frame. But I thought her images were beautiful. And Gorin says, thank you so much for your videos on YouTube. Always inspiration to keep photography. Oh, thanks. Thanks. I'm happy to do it. I, I want to get back to making some videos. Now that I'm feeling better um, and the weather's warming up, man, I'm going to I'm gonna do as much as I can because uh, it, it's killing me. I don't know. It's killing me that I just, I don't know. I got so many things on my mind. So let me tell you what happens. I, I think I'm caught up here. <laughs> you almost selected mine, Dave. <laughs> almost, almost, almost selected mine. It was close. Yeah, but Kimmy's was a lot simpler, right? More clear frame in a frame type image. My picture is like, unless you knew the subject was frame in a frame, I don't think it would have been that obvious. So I can see why you probably went the other direction. Um, And what is Serge talking about? No. Oh, the wine cell MRB 625s. Yeah, those work great. Let me see if I can pop this up. Uh, we were talking about batteries for the OM1. I think it's this one. Yeah. So the wine cells, the MRB 625s. It's my battery box here. <laughs> Batteries. I got I got a boatload of these batteries here. Where's my wine cells? Oh, it's not here anymore. I was just going to show you the box. Or I have one, but I, I don't. I must have used it. It's not in here anymore. But they sell those on eBay. That's where I got mine, and I use that in my OM1. I think. Uh, God, I'm all over the place with batteries. I don't know what batteries I use. I use whatever I can find. <laughs> Uh, but I have used the wine cells before, and they work great. All right, so I'm I'm watching uh, I'm watching um, you know I'm laying in the bed. I don't know Saturday or Monday. I forget what day it was. And you know, with a heating pad, trying to heal my neck, and. Uh, while I'm watching TV, I hear this like crack sound, like pop, right? And I, I at first I thought it was maybe my neighbor or something because they're always making noises like that. But the, the direction of the sound just felt like it was coming from inside the house, not from outside. So I put the TV on mute and I hear this water gushing. I'm like, oh crap, did a pipe break, you know, in my house? Oh, the weirdest thing, though, I go out into the hallway and I hear the sound coming from the bathroom in the hallway. And the, the tank on the toilet cracked. And it wasn't because it was frozen water, because you, you guys know I keep my house pretty cold, like 45, 50 degrees uh, on a regular basis. But I don't keep it down at freezing temperatures like 32 or below, right? I, you know, whatever. I try to keep the house right around 50 degrees, plus or minus 5 degrees. 
So when it drops down into the 40s, you know, I turn the heat on until it gets up to about 55, then I turn the heat off. And that usually keeps the house right in that window. Um, but yeah, I go into the bathroom and, and the tank, it's a certain, you know, and the tank is surround. I never heard it. Why would the tank just crack on its own like that? And I don't use that bathroom very often, you know, it just cracked. Um, and then, and then, but it's the, it's the original tank. So it's really old. It's the original tank. I think when the house was built, cause it's like this pink, dark pink kind of color ceramic. <laughs> And uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to have to anyway, and they don't sell that color anymore. So I had to go out and buy a white toilet. So I spent like, you know, and I, I, I did everything in about four hours from the time the tank cracked to the time I finished installing the tank, the new, the new toilet. But I had to carry, you know, these hundred pound ceramic toilet bowls. Oh, and that. Then I was out for the rest of the day. I couldn't do anything. I just had to lay down because my neck was killing me after that. Carrying carrying a toilet bowl. And now I'm trying to think of how do you dispose of a toilet bowl? I guess I got to take it down to the dump. Uh, and, then, and, and now the bathroom just smells like, just doesn't smell right. There was probably, you know, 60 years of poop uh, underneath the old toilet. It's probably just rust, but it was just nasty. So I cleaned as much of that as I can, and, and the carpet is still wet. I've had a fan on it for a few days now, and it just will not dry out. I don't know why. Uh, but we're getting there. As soon as, soon as, as soon as that dries out, i got to replace the sink now because the sink is purple or this dark pink. And of course, all the tile is pink, so I'm going to have white sink and a white toilet with pink tiles. <laughs> but I don't care. It's just a guest bathroom. Old toilet bowls make great planners for. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> um. <laughs> what, what is this carpet in the bathroom yeah i didn't put the carpet there is my stupid uncle back you know i don't know carpet was there when i got here is all i can say i i was gonna rip it out um but then i'd have to reseat the toilet and 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 after I put the new toilet in, my neck was killing me, and I wasn't ready to rip out the carpet after doing all of that work. Carry, you know, just carrying the toilet from the hardware store back to my house. You know, I drove back, but carrying it, oh. And Marco Marco said something really funny. What is is it? This one. How we can go in there, so to speak. Um, <laughs> damn, bro, what did you eat? I didn't crack the bowl, like the tank cracked. <laughs> um, and Randy says, what do you think of the M10 for my video stuff? It's okay. The, the autofocus, I mean, I don't know what you're doing with video, but uh, the autofocus isn't quite as reliable as, say, the EM1 Mark II. If you're going to do video, if you're just going to fix the focus and record, it does great. You know, the quality is good as the M1 Mark II. But if, if you're going to rely on the autofocus at all, you'll have much better, uh, more consistent, better performance from an M1 Mark II. Uh, because of the phase detect, right? The, the, M1, the M10 Mark II is just contrast detect. So sometimes it'll lose you and never find you again, you know, uh, whereas the M1 Mark II is pretty reliable. That's what I use for all of my streams. And the M1 Mark III is, is also much better. Uh, some more low light photo walks. Yeah, I can do that, Goran. Yeah, I, you know, I when it when it gets warmer, it'll be easier to go out at night. I like night photography. 
Uh, I'm going to do some hardcore night photography. I'm thinking about, you know, I got all inspired by Ben doing some astrophotography and stuff. So I'm going to, I'm going to try and do some of that too. I found out that I live in a portal, a portal eight <laughs> is what I live in a very high portal seven to a portal eight, which is virtually, you know, totally polluted with light. But the Shenandoah Mountains, which is only a couple hours from me, is a low Bortle 4, almost a Bortle 3. Not quite, but very low Bortle 4. So I, I'm going to get great images there. And I've taken some photos out there before, but I didn't know what I was doing, you know. Now, I, not that I know now, but I feel uh, at least I can start <laughs> and, and have a methodology to getting better images. Oh, Randy's saying it's for mounting inside the car. Then all you can, yeah, then you don't need to worry about autofocus, right? Um, honestly, the, the pen PL8 will do that, you know? And if you're, if you're mounting the camera inside the car for recording in front of the car, um, yeah, either way is fine. EM10, the, the pen PL8 you have is fine for that. It doesn't have quite as many settings, right, as the M10 Mark II. Like, I think you're limited to like a 25 or a 30 FPS, uh, 25 or 30p video. I don't think you can do 60p, but um, it's it's perfectly fine for that. I wouldn't I wouldn't bother with an EM EM10 for video over a Pen PL8. The Pen PL8 was my primary vlogging camera for a long time until I got the M5 Mark III. That really replaced the EM10, uh, Pen PL8 for me. And EPL8 video is not that great. Maybe I had to. Yeah, I. I don't know. You're not going to get better with an EM10 Mark II from a Pen PL8. That's all I can tell you on that. Um, I'm trying to think. Was there anything I ever had a problem? Not really. I mean, it doesn't. It doesn't. But the DM10 has the same limitation. I was thinking of ISO. It has the same limitation. I think at ISO 3200 on the video. Uh, but you're not normally worried about that during the day. I can't. I can't think of any any particular thing that would that I would choose an EM10 Mark II over a Pen PL8 for video for, for that kind of application. And Dave says, I have the M1 Mark II. When I turn the shutter speed down to 60 seconds, it won't go any further. So how can I get live view composite? What's up with that? Uh, dang, I have... <laughs> My EM10 Mark II is, or EM1 Mark II is being is is doing the stream now. I can't just show you directly, but um, you need to be in uh, shutter priority, obviously, right? Or actually, you need to be in manual mode. I think. Let me see. Uh, what's the closest thing? EM5 Mark II, right? In a battery. I'm pretty sure you have to be in ma manual mode. And then, yeah, manual will take me into live count. Let me see if shutter speed. Yeah, you're probably in shutter priority. Put it in the manual mode, and that's when you can get into live comp and live, comp, live, live bulb and all that stuff. Let me know if that works while, while I'm here on the stream. If not, then I'll try and figure it out. And thanks, Rob. Good stuff for a newbie video creator. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, let's see. Hi from Lucanshire. Any tips on buying a tripod for EM10 for long exposure photography? What should I look for? Yeah, uh, you want one that's very, very sturdy. Okay, so buy, buy a relatively heavy tripod like at least make it aluminum. Don't buy like the carbon fibers. 
and then have a very good replaceable uh, platform or have a platform and that's what you mount your uh, ball heads and gear heads and uh, different kinds of heads so that you can mount your camera or telescope. So you wanna have a tripod that's strong and sturdy and has a little bit of heft to it. So at least get an aluminum tripod with a good platform on it. And uh, let me see if I can just show you. I'll show you what I have. And then the other thing is make sure the feet are, are replaceable or interchangeable on the feet because sometimes uh, you might want to use spikes or you want to might you might want to add dampeners to the bottom so a good astrophotography tripod has like uh, replaceable feet or good tripods it doesn't have to be astrophotography have have the little feet on the bottom can be changed um, and I think those are really the only the only things I can think of uh, by platform is this working or not it is I just have to unscrew it So, see if I can do this without. So, here is, just ignore this. This is a great tripod, this Manfrotto. Uh, the D555X Pro B. This is an excellent tripod, I think, for Astro. But the platform is, is this part right here. Oops. Get this. This part right here. Um, and this is like, this is just something I'm mounting onto the platform. I wish I could screw that off though. So you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, there we go. So, um, this is the platform, right? Make sure this is really solid, nice, you know, nice and thick and heavy. Um, that's the main thing. You don't need this, this right angle articulating thing. That's another thing I would think about is, uh, is try to try to make sure the tripod has as few moving parts as possible. So the stock is, you know, nice and secure. Um, good, strong platform, good, sturdy legs with replaceable feet. That's all I can think of. You know, a good person to ask would be Ben Chapel over on the Narrowband channel. So go to his channel and on any of his videos, just leave a comment like on his most recent video about gear. He has a video about gear, but he didn't talk about tripods in that video amazingly. But leave a comment there and ask him what to look for in a tripod and he'll, he'll give you an excellent recommendation. I'm just kind of giving you what I think would be would be good for Astro because you want it to be nice and stable. And <laughs> music is here. How are you? <laughs> just sneaking in from work. That's cool. Yeah, and Thomas has asked us, some areas in West Virginia are border one. Yeah, uh, that's about a five-hour drive for me, which isn't terrible. Um, I did see those sites. You know, they were nice and dark. And I think they have a few, uh, or they have a lot of uh, clubs out there for astrophotography as well that where a lot of clubs from around the region meet there in those border one areas. Um, so I'm definitely going to look into that this year as well. Sorry, I'm just skimming through the uh, comments to see if I missed anything.
Um, and then, you know, the last thing I'll say about tripods, because you, you mentioned that you have an EM10. Uh, <clears throat> the beauty of the EM10, a lot of people, according to Ben, use the EM10 Mark II for um, astrophotography because it's so small and lightweight. And it, you know, the less weight you're dealing with on the camera side, probably the less errors you'll have in motion if you're using a track or something because weight, then you don't need, you know, less need for counter counterbalance and all of that. <clears throat> but definitely check out Ben's channel for the, for, for more specific information. And JM is here. He says, hi, Rob. Miguel from Portugal in OMD 10 Mark III. Can I configure the histogram? I did not find the histogram settings. Ah, I don't have an EM10 Mark III, but if I recall, that is another thing that's not configurable on the EM10 Mark III. It's something they took away, I believe. Um, if it's not in the same place as it is on on the M10 Mark II, then, then they took it out as far as I know. Let's see. Oh, I can't see nothing. Uh, I believe it's display histogram settings. So menu D right here, histogram settings. So if it's not if it's not in menu D right there, then they they probably took it out unfortunately um sad, sadly and that you know they they took a lot of things not a lot but they did take away a few things from the M10 Mark 3 that were very accessible in the M10 Mark 2 like silent shutter you can only access from AP mode but then that forces you to be in program mode things like that um they, they tried to fix some of it with firmware because people were bitching. I know like they they brought back the flash, remote flash, remote control flash back into the menu because they had taken it out originally. But some things I don't think they'll ever bring back. If they haven't done it by now, they'll probably never will. Yeah, J JM says it's not there. So yeah, unfortunately, I don't know. I don't think I don't think they have it anymore. It's not critical though. It doesn't affect your images at all. It ju it's just a visual aid for taking pictures, right? So um, it's it's not. It shouldn't be a deal breaker at all. But I would say um, uh, you're not you're not missing out a lot. It's just a visual aid. I mean, it's nice to have, but it doesn't it doesn't affect your image quality at all. It just helps you to uh, work with the exposure. You know, it limits the range. Oh, Rick is here. Hey, Rick, how are you? Here's some uh, feedback about the tripod, and I'll just share that with everyone on the stream. It says, heavy is the key for stability, else any wind hitting the tripod will affect the stability. Make it light to carry yet lightweight. Make a light to carry yet light heavyweight tripod by dangling the weight under the teapot rocks water. Mm, I'm not sure what that last part is, unless you didn't you didn't get the chance to finish your uh, your message there. And Serge says, do you, do you name any of your photos? I think sometimes it can be helped to people to understand the story that you try to tell uh time to time rarely let me rephrase that i rarely name the photos anything i just use whatever the file name is the camera kicks out to be honest and then um because i never um i've never submitted my images really to any competitions or anywhere that anybody would care to see my photos because my photos aren't that great to be honest so I don't I don't name them. I do name them for my professional work, 
I, I put the address of the of the property in the file name so that when the client receives it, you know, they'll know which property the the images are for because you know after a while you know all properties look alike sometimes and um i don't want there to be any confusion when they download the images and put it into their own you know formats or whatever they post them online and stuff which property those photos are for so that's the only time i really name them uh, for my personal stuff i i've never named them some people like to name them uh, instead of when they import the photos, they name them on import of the location uh, for sorting purposes and finding these images years and years later, right? Because the, the, the theory is, or the thinking is, you know, if I want to find a photo of a birthday party from five years ago, um, well, that's a bad example because birthdays are on a specific date. Let's say a vacation that I did five or six years ago, and I'm not sure exactly what year I went or what month I went. If I had named the photo on import the name of the vacation that I went to, like Hawaii, right? I would name the files Hawaii. Then it would be easy for me to go back and find those because I can sort the photos by name or search by name the file names and find those photos a lot easier. So some people like to organize their photos by file name and renaming those files to whatever event or topic or subject that they took pictures of so that they can find them easier later, right? Because it would be very difficult for me to find a photo chronologically if I don't remember the exact year or date that I took that picture, right? But I remember, yeah, I took a picture of, you know, Maui, but I can't remember what when that was exactly. It was like 10 years ago, you know? So it makes it harder to find things sometimes if you do things chronologically. I do things chronologically, um, and it's just the way I've been doing it forever, but some people, they, they like to name their files for that reason, for sorting and organizing rather than doing it chronologically. But for telling a story or anything like that, no. I, I really don't accept when I deliver to clients. Video quality is not good on my EPLA because it could, yeah, if you convert a full spectrum, yeah, it's not the same. <laughs> um, okay, so if you want to buy another camera, um, EM10, EM10 or EM5, EM5 has better image stabilization, so it'll do better inside a car than the EM10. And then, of course, the EM1 Mark II has the best image stabilization. But I probably go with the EM5 Mark II for video because of the better image stabilization over the EM10 Mark II. It's maybe only a half a stop or a full stop difference. In, on paper, but in practice, I did notice a significant difference between the EM10 Mark II and the EM5 Mark II when it comes to video image stabilization. The EM5 Mark II is significantly better. And Oh, I see Surge is adding on. It's like when, um, when when he was asking if I if I name my files to tell a better story, Surge is saying it's like when people used to write on their Polaroid when the picture was taken for their uh, occasion. Yeah, I I get that, but a, a Polaroid is a physical thing, right? Files are all digital. I, I just, my brain doesn't think that way. If, it, if your brain thinks that way, you know, all the better. You know how our brains are. We're all wired a little bit differently. My brain just doesn't think that way. I'm a very chronological type guy. Uh, but I, I see where you're coming from. Um, sometimes what I used to do, I, I put it out on the table. I have a photo album where I print my four by fives and I put them in there. And then I sometimes I write notes about what that was if I felt like it inside the photo album. But um, um, yeah, renaming files, no, I don't do that because I, you know, 
like I said, I don't I don't send my pictures anywhere for anybody that would care to read the file name or anything like that. And Thomas says, I sort photos into files which date, year, month, day. That's how I do it. Um, I skip the underscores and the periods. I just put the full. I do that sometimes. Like I said, um, that's really the best way, in my opinion. I used to take time to do all that. I don't do it so much anymore. I got, I'm just very loosey goosey with my file sorting and and cataloging. To be honest, I use the I use Lightroom. So in Lightroom, I use keywords to categorize the images, um, to find them later. If you're not using some sort of data asset management software like Lightroom or whatever other software there is, then you need to resort to more uh, rudimentary type file naming systems or category, you know, cataloging type manuals, manual ways of doing it. But that's that's probably the main reason, come to think of it, why I don't really rename the files because once they're imported into Lightroom and cataloged, I use keywords. And Chan is here. Hi, Chan. Hello, everyone. Hi, Mr. Rob. Wish you and all good health. Thank you. I wish you the same. Uh, and let's see. I keep clicking the wrong thing. You know, I, I'm going to send in a suggestion for this, this uh, Melon app, guys because it's hard to work with the chat chat window. And let's see, Barry says, I recently got a 40 to 150 F4 to 5.6 for my EM10 Mark II, but didn't realize I couldn't can't use the 2X converter with this, only with the Pro version. Is there any way around this? No, there's not. Um, they, you know, yeah, there's no way around it, mainly because the... If, if you know the 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 teleconverter protrudes out in into you know away from the camera, it protrudes out. So you need you need the lens to have a little bit of a recess in it to mount it onto a teleconverter. And um, you know the um, the the kit lens, the the forty to one fifty f four just doesn't have any recess in it for the teleconverter. Um, I've seen people sell tele third party to, I haven't seen them for micro four thirds, but I remember with my Nikon, I bought tele converters, generic ones that would, that you could mount onto your camera. So you may want to look for a generic one if you want to try it, but it, just remember that the lens is already very slow. So if you put a two X tele converter on it, you're going to be like at F 11, you know, on the long end. And then you have to be in pretty bright daylight to get any any decent pictures at that at that aperture, uh, or you're going to be cranking your ISO and you're going to be losing resolution. So I don't recommend a teleconverter for for slow lenses like the forty to one fifty. Anyway, uh, it's better to take a picture with that forty to one fifty and just crop in, you know, rather than trying to use a teleconverter. And I'm scrolling through the text. Not sure why people are saying use extension tubes. Oh, here's here's one from Dave. Doesn't ACDC let you use multiple words to count? Yeah, ACDC does as well. In fact, I think ACDC is one of the few programs that actually manipulate the exit data, which has, um, I, I think it's uh, ITPC or IPTC, ITPC uh, data in the file itself has comments and categories and things. And that's something that I wish more programs would use is the actual ITPC information 
or spaces available in, say, the JPEGs and RAWs, rather than creating a separate catalog on their own. Um, so, yeah, ACDC is a great, great software. I was uh, I was offered a, a free copy of that from their, that company to review, but I never took them up on it because it's not a software I think I would use personally. Is as good as it is, uh, I just didn't see I didn't see myself using it in a way that I would need it professionally. If if I was like just doing only personal work, right? Just about any software off the shelf is very good. And I wouldn't be buying a subscription from Adobe. <laughs> but because Adobe Photoshop and Lightroom combined, that workflow, uh, it's very hard to duplicate in other software to do the kind of work that I do. Meaning I can select, you know, three images in Lightroom, right click it, open them up as layers in Photoshop, auto align the layers, do some processing on each layer and then merge them, flatten them back together and export it back in the Lightroom where everything is cataloged and organized and I can export. So I just have a workflow that I've gotten used to with Adobe that I, I haven't been able to find being able to duplicate in any other software um, effectively. And Goran says, any thoughts on Luminar A? I know uh, David Crooks here, who organizes our local photography club, is uh, uses that software a lot. He, he really likes it. And the few um, demonstrations I've seen and some editing I've seen, it's been very good. So, you know, with any software, really the best thing to do is to download the, the, the free trial if it's available and play with it for a day or two right and get a feel for the workflow and if that if that's in if it feels intuitive to you right um you know lightroom and photoshop is not terribly intuitive but because i've been using it for so long i know how to get around it's like the olympus menus right they're they're not very intuitive but because i've been using it and and doing tutorials on them it's very easy for me but Software is the same way. You need to find a software that's very intuitive. Uh, you know, there's there's raw therapy, there's darkroom, there's um, those are free, right? Raw therapy and darkroom, and then also um, the paid ones: Luminar AI, ACDC, uh, Adobe Photoshop Elements, which is a one-time, you know, perpetual license. There's Capture One, which my buddy Walter really loves. There's also, um, oh, the name escapes me now, but it's another pretty affordable software. But there's lots of them out there. So, you know, look for the free trials and see which ones you feel are easiest to use in terms of your workflow and being intuitive to you. Because I think all of them do an excellent job. Now, I have not found one that does as good a job at recovering highlights and shadows as Adobe. In, in, in all of the software I've tried, I haven't found any that do as good a job. Uh, I don't know how they do it better, but definitely highlight shadow, at least highlight recovery is definitely stronger in, in Lightroom than I've been able to duplicate in any other free trial that I've used. Um, so look for, take, take a very demanding file that has a high dynamic range, like some highlights that are clipped, some shadows that are clipped down, and try to recover the highlights and shadows and see which one performs better on your system as well. That's another comparison. And do some other tests that you think might be relevant to the kind of photography that you do. And again, being intuitive and, and usable for your workflow is also very important. And I guess I guess the idea is uh, Luminar, you know, Luminar has the artificial intelligence type things as well that they're they're growing and expanding on. Um, like the only one I can think of is like sky replacement. I think they have some portrait ones as well. And uh, 
I, I believe you can add Luminar AI as a plugin to like Lightroom, for example, and maybe some other like Capture One, but um, like I said, if you if you like editing photos and post processing and stuff, and 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 really, it's basically like a uh, the creative side of digital photography is working in post processing. Again, you know, experiment with all the different kinds. I'm not super. I'm not a super creative person, so you know, I'm content with the art filters and in, in Olympus. Uh, what's it called? Workspace. <laughs> I just click a few art filters and I'm good, right? But I know there's some people that really enjoy creating something from their images that you wouldn't see otherwise, right? Something you make it your own. Um, another software I use that's there's a free version that works pretty well is Photoscape. That has a lot of nice filters and things in it as well, but not not artificial intelligence type stuff. And then Bob is asking about Topaz and I haven't tried Topaz in almost two years, um, but I wasn't. Imp I was not impressed two years ago. But since then, there's been a lot of advances, right? And everyone's telling me it's the they they really like it now. Uh, its ability to reduce noise and save the details, um, the Topaz, Topaz noise reduction. I think there's the Topaz Gigapixel where it upscales your images and video potentially to higher res. And I've heard good things about that. But like I said, you have to download and try it yourself, right? And and try it on some challenging images that you have and see if you like the results. And if you do, I, I don't see a problem with getting it. I think um, uh, Peter Forsgaard has a couple of videos on it as well. Uh, so you can get his thoughts on it from him. I mean, I think he liked it as much too. Uh, but me personally, I'm, I'm more of a, I'm more content with just the very basic things when it comes to photo editing. I just cannot spend too much time on it because professionally uh, speaking, I, I try to make the images as realistic as possible in real estate photography. It has to be, you know, as, as authentic as possible with as few modifications to the lighting and the color and all of that. So when I do my own personal photography, you know, I, lo I love the art filters that Olympus has, and I like playing with those, but I I don't get too much into all of the other things that are possible using software and computational type things that, you know, artificial intelligence type things that these, these softwares do, um, particularly like the noise reduction and the gigapixel, and there might be some other things, some HDR. I mean, they got so many different layers, right, in Topaz. Uh, that you can or modules that you can buy separately, and um, I I don't see for me it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't add anything for me in terms of my the the joy I get from photography is not on the post processing side. Uh, I'm more of like I like in the field being able to capture the images in camera with the kinds of looks that you can do in camera with the art filters or uh, highlight shadows, you know those kinds of things, and that's where I find you know. Uh, what I what I enjoy, right? Whereas a lot of people, you know, they, they like pulling the raw files in and then doing that creation process or that creative process in software. Uh, but I'm I'm sort of like more of the do the creative thing in field. That's all. And uh, Marco has some feedback here on Topaz. The Topaz app seemed to have gotten progressively worse as they continue to update the AI models and software. The artifacts introduced in Gigapixel AI are bad, and and Denoise AI is blah. Oh, okay. Um, that that sort of goes back to my experience with Topaz AI from two years ago. Was I felt like um, I could do a better job or an equivalent job myself using Lightroom. You know, once you understand the sliders and what each one is doing exactly to the image, to, to the point that once you print the image out, it looks fine. Uh, so, you know, like I said, the, the post-processing side is not a big part for me in terms for my personal photography so much as it is um, in, in my professional work where that that has to be. Um, that has to be as authentic as possible. And I captured when I'm there, right? I use 
I bring my own lighting and flash. I don't have to worry about noise, you know, all kinds of things, right? Uh, and I bracket exposures, so I don't have to worry about clipping highlights or shadows. So I'm all about doing it in the field and getting satisfaction from that rather than post-processing. Not that you can't do a lot in post-processing. You know, you can bracket shots in the field and go into post-processing and do even more creative things, right? It's just the whole, the whole post-processing side is a whole different area that is definitely some people really enjoy and some people like me just want to get through it as quickly as possible, right? <laughs> And Marco says, best denoise I've used to date is Deep Prime in DxO Photo Lab. Okay. And David says, I disagree about denoise AI. Yeah, I've never, um, I don't use it, so. Let's see, what is this from Rick says, best advice I got as an apprentice photographer, always take the heaviest, most solidly built tripod you can. My tripod is often heavier than the combined weight of everything else in my kit. And you know, Rick made a very good point earlier, if I didn't reiterate this was, you know, that the one of the reasons for the heavier tripod is to um, make it more stable if the conditions are a little bit windy, right? Because astrophotography is, is a very precise uh, type of photography. And the slightest movements, you know, micro, you know, micro millimeters or whatever, whatever. <laughs> my metrics are bad. Um, they're centimeters, millimeters, whatever is beyond that, you know, just the slightest movement uh, can really affect you know, your astrophotography, certainly wind. Uh, I know Ben sometimes, he doesn't even go out because of the wind, right? And some, and that's probably because he's using big telescopes too, which are like wind sails, but a uh, sturdy tripod definitely is, is a must. And let me just check something here. Oh, we're doing good. And Jeff, Jeff Painter says, um, Jeff says he's had good results with Topaz Denoise and Sharpen AI. And like I said, that it goes back to, you just have to download and try it and see. And Rick says, speaking as an expert in artificial intelligence, my concern about going down the AI route is it'll give everyone similar results because you're letting the AI, AI do the thinking. Um, yeah, I've heard this argument, yeah, for years, right? And, you know, the, the where they've had software that'll tell you, you know, like I was taking a picture of my bedroom, right? Uh and it had some little marker on there where I lined it up and it would say, this is the best shot. So somehow it was trying to tell me what was a good composition, what was not. And it's never right. <laughs> um, and, you know, like, like in real estate photography, you know, you want your line straight. But this, the, the phone was telling me to adjust the, the, the composition in a way where the lines were not straight or was not capturing the parts of the room that I wanted to. So I don't know what kind of AI was doing to tell me how to take this picture, but it was definitely wrong. But yeah, if everybody went in to take a picture and the software tells you what would be a good composition, then everybody's gonna take the same pictures, right? Compositionally. And then if the AI is also determining highlights and shadows and what what it thinks is a proper exposure, and then everybody's images are going to have the same composition and the same exposure. And then you take that another step further, another step further, and that's where I think Rick is leading to is that AI can basically take over and tell you and, and create the same image no matter who's taking the picture. 
because when you take a picture, right, you're creating an image. And sometimes I like to crush the shadows down to completely black and have a very low key image. Or sometimes I want a high key image, you know, and artificial intelligence to some extent may not understand my creative choices and and really limit my photography. So, um, but yeah, I, I get where you're coming from, Rick. It, it makes sense. And this is a good point too, is when you get software, some software uses uh, a lot of memory. So the comment here from PJ Bell is, Topaz takes so much memory to use. So I agree with Ross, spend time out in the field. Um, because the you know the way AI works or any kind of software, a lot of times they take, they store multiple versions of your image in memory, while it's processing, and so it might store 20, 30, 40 copies of that image in memory, to do these comparisons, to apply to to get the data points so it can do the artificial intelligence on whatever process you're trying or whatever end result you're trying to get to. So, you know, it, I think it's a valid point. Look at what the recommended hardware requirements are if they have them listed for that software and make sure you have at least that, if not more uh, than what they require. Because otherwise it can be a very frustrating experience if, you know, you download the software and it's just taking forever and it's not doing as good a job because it doesn't have the resources to do the kind of job it needs to do, for example, or at least in the time you want it to do it. So that's why, you know, I have like 32 to 40 gigs on all my computers because I don't want any memory limitations. And that, and those are the limits that my laptops can handle. My one laptop is a 32 gig max and this laptop that I'm using now is a 40 gig max. So, um, you know, I, memory is definitely the best upgrade you can do for any computer. Um, but okay. And I'm sure Marco would agree, right? <laughs> memory and a video card. If you have a, if you have a desktop and you can replace the uh, video card. And DeMorgan says, Topaz software really works. The GPU sets it at 100%. It makes a big difference which graphics card you use. Oh, well, that's what I was just saying, right? Uh, so I have plenty of memory and have a very good uh, GPU. <laughs> Dave says, when AI tells you how to take a picture, it's no longer your picture. Wouldn't that be funny if... If let's say Apple or whoever, Samsung, whoever makes phones, right, has all this AI built into their camera and you take a picture, but everything is copyrighted to Apple and Samsung because they developed the artificial intelligence to take the image for you. <laughs> so you don't, you, you no longer own your pictures. Literally, you know, legally speaking, maybe you'll never not own your pictures anymore if that's the case. That would be kind of scary, wouldn't it? I mean, in a way, every time we upload our images to Instagram or Facebook, we, we're basically giving our rights away to those images. Even though we may still own them, we're giving up all our rights, so it's virtually like we don't own them anyway. Um, just imagine if, if there's fine print in Apple phones or Samsung phones, whatever phone, that in the fine print it says, because you're using artificial our, our artificial intelligence software, the images you take copyright belong to us <laughs> or you're giving up all your rights to the images i wouldn't be surprised if that happens and rick says if you guys watch netflix you've come across bad ai netflix wants the ai to choose what you watch the ultimate aim is no human intervention or thought in choosing what you watch yeah the suggested you know just for you and all of that so I always have a my list in Netflix that I always go to. And it's rare that, well, let me rephrase that. Time to time, though, it'll recommend something that I said, oh, that looks interesting, and I'll watch it, and it was actually really good. But most of the stuff I watch comes from recommendations from other people, you know. Recommendations from Netflix, 
you know, there's so much stuff out there. It's just unbelievable how much stuff is out there that, you know, I, I don't really like a lot of the recommendations they make. And, and it, I don't think it's Netflix's fault. I think it's just that I have a very narrow taste of things I like to watch. And John says uh, to Rick, I try to get shots as good as I can in camera, then only use light touch and post. No heavy post processing for me, although people who really are good in post can create some amazing. Oh, definitely. You know, John, I've seen, you know, especially if you like to do composites and things. I mean, in my own photo editing live stream, you guys do amazing work uh, to my images because um, I always put my image out there for you guys to edit. And I'm always amazed um the kind of images you guys get and definitely i've seen some really really high-end type composite work i can't remember who the guy was but uh even if you look at james pops early instagram images he did a lot of composites that were very creative and and a lot of fun right so check out check out some early photos from Jane Pops's uh, Instagram. He has some he has some fun photos there. And for sharpening, I simply blend in high pass image at low flow align. Low flow again works well enough for my purposes. I've never done any of the high pass type stuff. You know, I do low flow a lot with brushing in, in my real estate photography, um, just to touch up and make the image pop a little bit sometimes, but and David says, AI for me is just suggestions and I make a final decision. Yes, absolutely. And Marco, for most perceptible performance impact of fast SSD, if you're moving from a hard drive, lots of memory and GPU. Yes, Rob, you are on point. Thank you. Um, yeah, I didn't even think about the SSD. <laughs> but yeah, the first thing you should get, I think, still is memory. And then an SSD. And then um, definitely a GPU. Uh, because if you do GPU first... If you don't have memory to begin with, this you're still going to be bottlenecked. And then if you have, uh, if you get an SSD first, you know memory is always the bottleneck. You know, I mean, an SSD can kind of offset any lack of memory to some extent, but it's not the same as memory, right? Memory is the fastest way to um, improve your computer performance. And then I'd go maybe SSD, and then maybe GPU last depending on the applications. Some apps are very GPU dependent, like gaming, right? So it'd make more sense to do memory and GPU for gaming. But for photo editing and video editing, I feel like memory, SSD, then GPU last. Uh, if you have an Intel chipset, if you have an AMD chipset, then I would do memory and then GPU, then SSD. I don't know. It's all important, right? <laughs> And whoops, let's see, what's this? Randy says, mirrorless comparison says that the EM10 Mark III has better stabilization than the EM5 Mark II, but then the cost goes up for the EM10 Mark III compared to the EM5 Mark II. That's interesting that they say the EM10 Mark III has better stabilization than the EM5. I don't have an EM10 Mark III to compare, but that would surprise me a little bit. Um, but I would still go with an EM10 Mark II over a Mark III, even for video work, unless you really need 4K, which at that point, you need to go back to an EM1 Mark II. And Marco says, depends if you're above 8 gig of RAM, but have a hard drive, and SSD will make the system wildly faster and provide you a better experience. 
Um, yeah, and I can't argue with Marco because he's a uh, he has a channel. Uh, the name escapes me now. Um, but eight gig of RAM, like I said, I think it really it really depends. But an SSD drive, it's you know my mom has a uh, old Windows Seven. You know, it's about an eight-year-old computer, and it had a standard hard drive, physical hard drive. And I said, you know, the only thing you need to do is update the SSD. And then, yeah, she got a much better experience. She turns the computer on. Within within 10 or 15 seconds, the computer boots up, and she's into Windows Chrome. Um, <clears throat> the challenge is, though, that that experience, yeah, she was so much happier how fast it was because, you know, when we had the old hard drive in there, it was taking a few minutes to boot up and run smoothly. And it was at least 15 minutes after that before the computer was actually chugging along at a, you know, smooth rate. But with the SSD in there, yeah, within 15 seconds, the computer had booted up. And within a minute, it was running pretty smoothly across the board. Right, and that's all due to the SSD. Uh, but as soon as she started opening up like two or three Chrome tabs, she started running into memory issues and CPU usage, and you know, uh, and that's where the C the SSD makes no difference. And um, so, you know, I told her just 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 open one window at a time in Chrome, <laughs> you know, maybe two at the most. Uh, then she won't be hitting those memory memory limitations. Um, and even even though it's supposedly caching to the SSD for more virtual memory, it's nowhere near as fast as regular, you know, uh, DDR type RAM, obviously, because it's it is a standard SATA SSD. It wasn't like the new NVMe SSDs. It was using a standard SATA SSD. And uh, so, you know, that's very slow relative to regular DDR, whereas NVMe is close to DDR RAM. <laughs> um, is the way I understand, I could be wrong, but it's pretty fast, right? And, but yeah, I, I think most people today, you got if you're going to do photo editing, you need to be at 16 gigs with a SSD. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's SATA or NVMe. They both performed about the same, at least on my setup. And then if you're going to do video work, you know, you need to be closer to 24, 32 gig of RAM. Um, 32 gig is really ideal for both photo and video with a true NVMe SSD, you know, and a good GPU, particularly for video work and all of that. But, you know, that's something we can talk about maybe in a combo stream, a collaboration type thing. Uh Rick says, engage 100% with Nextlix vision of how their AI works, and you will get better and better. Indeed, it, it gets so good you'll begin to love it. But take care how you train AI, badly trained AI. <laughs> yes, that is true. And, you know, to some extent, YouTube has AI built in, right? Because they have the suggested videos all the time. When I go on to, uh, when I go on to the homepage, they'll have a lot of recommended videos. And... Um, you know, YouTube goes, YouTube's algorithm goes to a degree, and I, I forget where I saw this, but uh, you, I can see it in my browsing when I'm in YouTube. It'll not only take into account the things that you watch, right, and try and find other things that are similar or what they think you might like, but they also suggest videos, different kinds of videos based on what time of day it is, what day of the week it is, um, you know, maybe even what device you're using. So, because I've noticed on the weekends, I get more like Star trek -y movie review type videos than I do during the week. And during the week, I get more of the technical type, newsy type uh, videos, like what's in the news, what's, you know, whether it's, you know, um, you know, political news or um, photography news. I get more technical type videos during the day 
and then the weekends I get, you know, so they, they, they take that algorithm even further. I don't know if Netflix does the same thing, um, but only working the AI to on, on, on a few metrics, you know, if, as soon as you start adding additional metrics and data points to the AI, like time of day, device that you're using or, you know, location, you know, maybe, maybe it knows that when I'm at work, I only watch these kinds of videos, but then when I'm at a different IP address, I watch these kinds of videos on this day at this time. So it's going to push those kinds of, you know what I mean? It's like they, they can get really pretty elaborate with the data points and probably a hundred other things. Like I guarantee to you, Amazon Alexa is listening all the time. And I'll tell you why. Because I was I was watching uh, some astrophotography videos, right? My Alexa device is right next to my TV. And I went into the kitchen to cook something. And while I was there, I have another Alexa device there. Little messages pop up that say, you know, that recommend, you know, try this or try this. This is another thing Alexa can do. And when I went into the kitchen, freaking Alexa... I hope I'm not setting anybody's Alexa devices off right now. <laughs> they popped up a message, you know, try our Star Finder app. And I was like, what the hell? So I'm watching YouTube astrophotography videos. And within the hour, I go into the kitchen and there's a freaking message on, on Amazon Alexa that says, try our Starfinder app. So I know it was listening to my frickin' uh, TV. Either that, because the TV, my, my TV, I use Roku, right, which is a whole separate thing, which is not tied in with Alexa. And so I don't think they were sharing data points. Maybe they were, and that's how Alexa, but that's not the first time that's happened. I always thought it was really weird that I would be doing something and then Alexa knows exactly what I'm thinking, like it's psychic, like it recommends something, whether it's in my shopping cart or pop-up ads or whatever. These things are really scary sometimes, how, how good they are, because I'm like, that's exactly what I was looking for. <laughs> Anyhow. <laughs> Um, John says, this is why when it comes to anything internet related, I try to keep my head down as much as possible, right? I know, it, but you know, if you have these devices in your house, just listening to everything, <laughs> And PJ says, you've been invaded. There goes your privacy. Absolutely. And Randy says, find the M10 Mark II on eBay for 200 bucks. Thinking, of, yeah, just buy it. 200 bucks. Yeah, just buy it. I wouldn't hesitate. If it's in good condition, yeah. And Marco says... We need to geek out together. There's a lot of nuances between memory and tears and SSD. Yeah, I know, right? I mean, I'm just, just an amateur consumer type computer guy, right? I mean, I have some background from 20 years ago in computers, but all the current tech, yeah, no, none of that. When I was doing computers on a, on a high level 20 some years ago, I was dealing with, um, uh, they didn't call it even DDR, it was just DRAM, right? S SD RAM? It wasn't even DDR. I can't remember. It's been so long. Uh, but it was it was 32 bit memory. And you would I would upgrade eight eight megs at a time. Eight megabytes, not eight gigabytes. <laughs> but I was upgrading eight megabytes at a time. Well, we'll we'll geek out one day. That would be fun. And C.W. Ray is here. Awesome. Good to see you. 
And Marco says, our phones and smart devices are definitely listening. My wife was talking to me about new comforters for our bed. Went to my office in another room, hit Facebook, and was <laughs> getting asked from them. I know, right? It's crazy. I mean, when I when they first started, when word was getting out that you know people were leaving cookies, you know your computers are collecting all these cookies and and serving you ads based on your interests because they know where you've been surfing. I mean, I was kind of like, well, you know, yeah, I I want relevant ads. I don't want to see ads for you know. Um, something I, I could care less about, you know. Um, like, I want to see ads on cameras, and I want to see ads on cars, and I want to see ads on, you know, stuff I'm interested in. So I didn't mind the cookie, cookie stuff, right? But now when the devices are listening to you and tracking you 10 different ways to Sunday, you know, <laughs> there's, there's got to be a limit to, like, how much information they should really know about you. I swear to God, I'm watching TV and and like I was watching a bunch of videos on on watches, right? You know, just like like wrist watches. And I I start watching my favorite show on TV and then I start seeing commercials for watches on the TV. And I'm like, what are the odds of that? that I was watching YouTube videos on wristwatches and then I go watch TV and a freaking wristwatch commercial comes on. <laughs> I mean, it just, maybe, maybe, maybe this company wants to start selling a lot of watches and it's just a coincidence, but I, I don't know. I'm not so sure anymore. And see there, oh, trying to, Trying to dabble in macro and the amount of technical knowledge needed is mind-boggling. <laughs> yeah, macro is uh, another area. I mean, all types of photography, you can you can get carried away with the technical things about it. Um, but luckily, I think macro, I think macros probably only the only thing harder is maybe astrophotography, really. Right, so I don't. I don't like Win 10. It's too glitzy. No, I love Windows 10. I don't have a problem with it. Um, what am I saying? Don't forget to... Oh, thanks, David. <laughs> You're still here. I appreciate that. Um, time is... Oh, it's 11.40. I should probably wrap it up soon. What's a note here? Compare Windows 10 Professional with Windows XP. Windows 10 uses AI to make things simpler, but XP gave better control if you knew what you're doing. Too often AI is dumbing down. Well, I think, I think Windows 10, the main thing they really, and this is all speculation for me, right? But they really went hardcore into data gathering, right? Of your habits, apps, everything that you use in Windows 10. They have the Windows, the Windows uh, Microsoft Store, um, and they really geared Windows 10, yeah, to make it easier, maybe a cleaner, polished interface, but. Uh, I feel like they really buried into it a lot of a lot of data gathering metrics that you can't turn off unless you're like some guru, you know, technical guru. Uh, even if you turn everything off in in the settings, supposedly it cap still captures a lot of a lot of information about you. Whereas Windows 7, I didn't feel like had that level of integration with the data data gathering. Uh, if you turn things off in Windows 7, they were off, right? Um, but in exchange for all of this data gathering, you know, you give up a little bit of your privacy. They give you a more polished user-friendly interface with Windows 10. So I really like Windows 10, but I'm always a little leery of all the, all the privacy you kind of give up in exchange. I mean, it's, it's just a trade-off, you know, I mean, it's, it's very frustrating to have to give so much information out about your private, your, you know, 
your privacy and not I'm not talking like birthday and social security and all of that, but I'm talking about like your habits and things that you do online. Uh, having this information just out there for people to use for whatever their purposes are, but that information being available to anyone, you know, that Microsoft feels they can give to is, is a little troublesome to me. But I don't, I don't have another solution other than if I want to go Linux, but then I have a lot of, you know, there's so many apps that I use on Windows. So again, I, I, I have to accept that trade-off in my personal privacy for the convenience of the different things I like to do. And Leon says, Robert, you're told the 40 f 28 Pro Lens now okay, and can you use it like before? Yes, I'm using it right now, as a matter of fact, for this live stream. So it's working great. See, if I put my hand up, focuses, come back. Yeah, it's working great. I mean, there's a couple of spots on the, on the elements inside, but, you know, like I so said, I'm not a pixel peeper to... I, I doubt anybody would be able to tell the difference between my lens and a brand new one, even pixel peeping, because the spots are very small, but they're, you know, it's not perfect. But it works great. But right here on my desk, I don't know if you can see it. Let's see if I can do this without dropping it. Is it going to focus? See this little washer? It's very, very small. Let me back up a little bit. There it is. Get out of the frame. Well, anyway, it's a little tiny metal washer. So there's always a few parts left over when I put things back together. This was just a little metal washer. Now I drop it. Anyway, it's gone. It's so tiny. I don't know what it was for, but... But it's working great. And let's see. Rick says, you are legally entitled to see what data the big Internet companies have on you. Then assuming you understand the data, you'll be amazed at how detailed the profile they have on you. Yeah. Yep. Sometimes I don't want to know how much they know. Four-cylinder. What the heck are you talking about, Randy? I know your Marauder is not a four-cylinder. <laughs> Marauder, I'm sorry. Was it related to this question? Does EcoSport have three-cylinder engine? I have no idea what you guys are talking about. And what's this one here? Uncle BMW. Hey, Rob Trick. How are you talking about Windows? Miss your tutorials on cameras. Greetings from Kuala Lumpur. Hey, how are you? Um... Yeah, I don't know why we got on the Windows. I forget. We were talking about computers and what what stuff to, what kind of stuff helps improve the performance, which in turn would would improve the performance of your photo editing and video editing. But um, yeah, I just get off into those tangents. What's David say? I did not like Windows Ten more more for a tablet on a PC. Yeah, I, I preferred it actually. I wish I wish and Apple's almost there as far as I know. I mean I'm not a big Apple guy. But I, I would love it if our our PCs were on tablets. Like the, the Microsoft Surface. I mean I wish our tablets didn't have a different operating system, is what I'm saying. And I get why they have to do it, you know. But we, we should be close to a point to where the hardware is good enough that you can run any operating system on any device uh, and not, not suffer any kind of performance penalty. And, oh, you bought the M9. Congrats. <laughs> it's a great camera. And... The, you know, the M10 Mark II, gosh, I, I'll eventually buy another one. I I just have no need to because I have my EM5 Mark II, which um, doesn't get a lot of uh, show, show time. 
but I'm using this is my EM10 Mark II. I'm using this actually in my studio now, which I had showed earlier. You know, I mounted it onto this thing so I can I can show uh, different buttons and stuff. I mean, it works fine for that, but for photography, you know, the couple of problems I'm having with it is like the dial now, the mode dial. Sometimes I'll turn the mode dial, but it doesn't change modes. And I have to jiggle it a little bit <laughs> and it'll change over. Uh, so the, the potentiometer or whatever, the switch inside here is, is getting flaky. And then um, uh, the internal capacitor that stores a little bit of charge to save the date and time is gone. Every time I turn the camera on, it always says time and date. You know, I got to set the time and date. So little things here and there that I have problems with. Um, the EVF auto switch between the EVF and the live view is broken. The eye detect part, you know, again, it's because I've dropped it a billion times, but. And DeMorgan says, my Windows 10 issue is how big that file is when I go to the reg edit. The file is a monster and you have to go to 10 places for one thing. Then they upgrade and you have to do it again. Oh, yeah, if you're, man, I haven't had to deal with regedit in a long time. But that's, um, I'm trying to think. I used to have to do it for something. I used to have problems with, with network security issues. And I would go into the registry editor and change different settings so that I could get past the firewall or, or access a certain type printer on the network. It was, and this was, this was for a client. It wasn't for me, but I had to go into the reg edit because the, the, the copier printer machine, when they upgraded to windows 10, they no longer had access to their printer. Um, because Windows 10 was blocking, I can't remember exactly what it was, but I had to go into the reg edit and change some settings so that the printer would be recognized on the network. Um, it was either that, it's something like that, but yeah, it's crazy. I'm not a technical guy anymore, but yeah, I used to get into all that stuff. <laughs> Randy says, I used to be a registry expert. <sighs> Not me, man. I would just go on online and look up, I forget what site it is, Stack, uh, Stack Flow or Flow Stack, whatever. They would have all these different solutions, you know, for technical issues. Mm. Man, I'm feeling good. My neck is like not bothering me at all. And I've been on this almost two hours, which is awesome. IT still lets me get it get it to work how I want and get rid of what I do not want, but it is a mess now. I have no idea what you guys are talking about. And then uh, what is Randy talking about? Now I need to download the PDF, and then Rick said, uh, get a proper big 4x4. Oh, this is totally unrelated. Yeah, four by four. I, I have a four by four Jeep. Uh, I bought it because I, I like to go camping and it does take let you go places or for me it was not about getting places that I that I couldn't get to otherwise. The four by four was about not getting stuck in places that I like to go. <laughs> Cause there are there are places I've went in my beetle that I got stuck. And you know, my Mazda would get stuck the same exact way. Whereas my Jeep, you know, I'm able to pull off the shoulder where there's no shoulder. I can just pull off into the ditch a little bit and get out without worrying too much uh, because all four wheels had power, right? Four by four rocks. Uh, but as far as downloading PDFs for the M10, what I would do, Randy, is actually update the firmware and then get the manual that goes with that firmware because there's different versions of the PDF. If you download the latest one, 
PDF, make sure you update the firmware as well so that everything matches from your camera to that uh, manual that you download. Ah, uh, no can afford. You know, I bought my Jeep for 4500 bucks. I mean, I got very lucky, but that's that's less than, you know, a couple of pieces of gear that you own, Randy, just to give it some perspective, you know? Because I think about like, God, that freaking 150 to 400 lens is $7,500, you know, that's more than I paid for my Jeep. And I love my Jeep. And Rick says, does anyone in the UK need a BLN50 battery? I have one you can have, brand new, but no use to me. Ah. Yeah, because you use the BLN1s, right? The BLS1 battery for the M5 Mark II. <clears throat> yeah, I would take it from you because, you know, my EM10 and my EM5 Mark, uh, EM5 Mark III uses the BLS, uh, BLM50. But okay, any other questions before I head out? Randy says, my Ford Escort is almost new. Bought it new, so new, no new cars, retired now. Yeah. Um, yeah, cars are just cars, right? I mean, you have your Marauder, right, Randy? Which is a really awesome, fun car to have. I wish I had, I mean, my, my Jeep is kind of my fun car to have. And the freaking Mazda I have, it's not the, you know, if I had a Miata, that would be an awesome Mazda, but my Mazda is just a Mazda 6. It's a nice little four-door sedan, but it's like, you know, it's just boring. <laughs> boring is all get out. I, I might I might trade my Jeep and my Mazda in and get me a, a Toyota uh, RAV, right? The hybrid RAVs they have now. So I'll get better gas mileage and I'll have four-wheel drive but I just don't have any money. <laughs> I'm going to have to, uh, I'm going to have to do something about that here soon. And what's this? Uh, Valdez, how are you? Is, is asking uh, EM10 Mark II, the 14 to 42 easy and auto open lens cap is a great pocket. Yes, it is. The, the auto lens cap is pretty cool, right? It stays on the camera. So, you, you know, when you put the camera in your pocket, you don't have to worry about scratching up the lens with stuff in your pocket. And then you whip it out and it just opens up by itself. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That's always been pretty cool. But all right, I'm going to head out. If there's no other questions or anything, I think uh, we've kind of covered everything. Um, as always, as always, I really appreciate you guys taking time out of your day to spend it with me. It's, again, it's the highlight of my day. Hopefully, I can get back into regular streaming and regular photo walks and blogging and all of that uh, now that the weather's warmed up and I'm feeling better. So I'm looking forward to that and sharing that with everyone. So you guys have an awesome day. I'll be back around in a couple hours to do the photo editing. So uh, I'll see many of you there. But until then, I'll be back. Uh, otherwise, I'll be back on Sunday. So you guys have a great weekend. I'm trying to end the stream. I can't find the right button. <laughs> I know you guys can still still hear me, right? Ah, there we go.